Coming up on DTNS, why it's still too early for online voting. Do you want a phone that swivels? And we break down Twitter's approach to COVID-19 misinformation. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, May 12th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the forests of Finland, I'm Patrick Beja. And from a cul-de-sac somewhere in Southern California, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just talking about hot sauce and my terrible tale of technology woe on Good Day Internet. If you want to get that and more, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Bloomberg sources say that Uber has made an offer to acquire food delivery startup Grubhub and that the two companies could reach an agreement as soon as the end of this month. Sony has created a logo for PlayStation Studios to be used by its internal studios like Naughty Dog and Insomniac. A Marvel Studios-like cinematic will play along with the logo before each PlayStation Studios game starts showing characters like Uncharted's Nathan Drake and Horizon Zero Dawn's Aloy. Android police noted Instagram is rolling back its Instagram Lite app after disappearing from the Google Play Store last month. Instagram Lite's low install size and bandwidth requirements were designed to help adoption in countries like Kenya, Mexico, and the Philippines. Instagram did tell TechCrunch it'll take what it learned from this test and build a new Lite app. Microsoft launched a preview for its family safety app for Android and iOS. The app syncs with Windows and Xbox devices and tracks screen time and app usage, sets time limits and content controls, and turns on location sharing. Estonia's parliament approved the Electronics uh, Communications Act Tuesday, requiring security reviews for telecom gear used in development of future networks. Details of implementation are left to the government, and the intelligence services are included in reviewing authorities. YouTube Music's rolling out a button that lets users move artists, albums, songs, playlists, purchase music, personal uploads, and recommendations from Google Play Music to YouTube Music, another notch on the road to the death of Google Play Music. The option will roll out to all users over the next few weeks and appear as a banner and a setting option in YouTube Music. The China Academy of Information and Communications Technology said Tuesday that smartphone shipments from China's factories to vendors rose 17% in April compared to the same month a year ago. Phone makers shipped 40.8 million handsets in April, up from 34.8 million in April of 2019. But the organization didn't report the percentage of Android devices shipped, which might mean something for iPhone shipments. August launched the Wi-Fi Smart Lock it announced at CES. The new version is 45% smaller and includes Wi-Fi, meaning there is no need for a bridge. It is available now in silver and black for 250 American dollars or bundled with optional keypad for 310 American dollars. Iceland began manual contact tracing of COVID-19 infections in March and in early April launched its app called Rocknin C19 that uses GPS data. The Icelandic app has the highest adoption rate in the world at 38% of Iceland's 364,000 people. Detective Inspector Gester Palmason, who oversees Iceland's contact tracing efforts, said the app, quote, has proven useful in a few cases, but it wasn't a game changer for us, adding that manual tracing is no less important. All right, let's talk about Quibi. Patrick, why not? Do we have to? Uh, I guess we do. Um, <laughs> Jeffrey Katzenberg told the New York Times, I attribute everything that has gone wrong to coronavirus everything <laughs> maybe he didn't have that emphasis but uh, it sounds like it it sounds like he did yeah yes mm. quibi predicted it would have seven million downloads by the end of its first year right now it says it is halfway there with 3.5 million 1.3 million which are active it's ranked number 125 on the apple store yet katzberg said the company is making enough gold out of hay here that I don't regret it. Quibi will add support for casting to TV to its iOS app this week, uh, this week and Android in the next few weeks. Quibi also plans to add features to share content on social media. Side note, a company named Echo is suing Quibi over theft of intellectual property regarding the turnstile feature. 
Tuesday Echo named Katzenberg and a few other Queeby, a few other Queeby employees as defendants. So uh, a lot of people are taking pot shots at Quibi uh, for Katzenberg's uh, I blame it all on the virus uh, quote. But honestly, I think that's fair. Quibi was meant, if it were going to succeed, to succeed amongst a populace that's out and about. Its entire use case was you're waiting in line at the store. You're waiting in line at the subway. You're walking around between meetings. Uh, so I, I think it's fair for him to to blame coronavirus, maybe not for everything, <laughs> but but to blame it in yeah. part, I'll, I'll, I'll give him that. The, the The question is, okay, would it have, how much more successful would it have been were there not a lockdown going on right at the beginning of its launch? You know, we talk a lot on the show about the idea of, uh, in particular, uh, game, game, games and game developers. Uh, the, the game launches are getting delayed because it's just harder to get a certain things done when you want them to be perfect before a launch. Okay, so if you think about the whole Quibi scenario, yeah, the premise was a little bit hard to swallow for a lot of folks because it's a crowded market, and the whole idea is it's highly produced content, it's on the go, it's not meant to be on you know large devices, you're not supposed to cast your, your television at home, uh, and it's not free, and you're going to love it. You know, so a lot of folks like me were kind of like, okay, well, let's see what you got. Well, then when their April launch came around, which wasn't delayed, that was the original launch, you know, within a week or so, it was really tough to sell, you know, and a lot of folks go like, well, I mean, short form content, look at TikTok, you know, it's killing it. Well, this is different. I mean, it's apples and oranges. So I do see why, and I think the quote may have been taken slightly out of context, Katzenberg would have said, I do blame the coronavirus for everything because he blames the launch on the coronavirus. And that did become a, what may have been something that you had to iterate kind of quickly. That happens to a lot of companies, something that it's like, well, everyone's at home, you know, you know, our whole workflow has been ground to a halt at very, very, very inopportune timing. Also, I would submit that things aren't super incredibly dire. Um, they planned 7 million downloads by the end of the year. 3.5, I'm sure, you know, you get a huge boost in when you launch. So maybe they were hoping to capitalize on that boost. But 3.5 isn't, you know, a tenth of it. It's half. And 1.3 million still active. It, a lot of people who download it are expected not to be to to remain active. Uh, 1.3 is not nothing. Now the question is how many of those will cancel their free trial uh, before it ends or shortly after. But um, it's not like they completely flopped, which is notable, I think. There you go. That's the headline Katzenberg wants to see. Quibi, not a complete flop. <laughs> yeah, we'll see when everybody's <laughs> free trials are over. Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey emailed employees on Tuesday saying that jobs that don't require a physical presence may continue to work from home indefinitely, forever. Business travel is canceled in September, and Dorsey said it was unlikely that Twitter would reopen the office then anyway. Twitter has canceled all in-person events through the rest through the rest of the year and raised the allowance for work from home supplies to one thousand dollars. Yeah, so we've been saying, uh, you know, we wonder when we'll see evidence that these companies are changing what they would do based on the fact that they're having to work from home. This is the first example of that. Uh, granted, Dorsey had said he kind of wanted to move this way before the virus happened. Uh, so this is a chance for him to do something he wanted to do anyway, but it's ahead of schedule. Uh, and and it's, it's Twitter deciding that there really isn't a reason, there really isn't a good reason given what they're seeing for them to force people back in the office. So unless you have to be in that data center swapping out the RAM uh, or you're, you know, you're maintaining the office when they eventually uh, open it back up, uh, they're not, at least Twitter is not gonna make you. I hope, I'm sure many companies are going to move that way. Um, I hope they still have an option to go to the office if and when they want to, uh, for at least part of the week or the month, because I think some people need that. And I mean, unfortunately, I don't have that opportunity because I, I'm independent and I work from home and my office is right here. So actually, I do have the opportunity. I just go to the office every day. Um, I also don't get the $1,000 of work from home supplies. 
which I would like to get from Jack Dorsey, please. But uh, yeah, work from home is awesome. I've been saying it for years. Uh, but it, I think for many people, it's also nice to have an office yeah. if you um, can. And, you know, and, the, the the Twitter headquarters in San Francisco is the only Twitter office I've ever been to. But it is nice. You know, it's like when you go to the Google you know, cafeteria for the first time and we go, are you serious? I Please let me work here. I'll do anything. Uh, it is nice. <laughs> uh, the fact that that whatever its form used to be is going to be very different. One would think they'd like to save a lot of money by not leasing that space anymore. But it kind of goes back to the conversation that a lot of us were having right at the beginning of this is, oh, if everything's on pause, what happens to all the people who work in, you know, the food service areas, who, you know, clean the floors after employees, you know, that, that are working late at night? The whole ecosystem is affected by a company like Twitter saying, you know, a lot of people are just never going to come back. It's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how much of this we're going to see, you know, as an effect long term. And, you know, it's nice for Twitter that they can do this. Not all businesses can do this. Uh, not all businesses are able to have their employees work from home, not just because they don't prefer it, because the business doesn't work that way. Uh, and not all employees work for a company that that would uh, be able to let them work from home. So there's there's also that gap opening up between tech companies, which can do this, and other industries that can't. Uh, Wired's Lily Hay Newman has an article up called Online Voting Has Worked So Far. That doesn't mean it's safe. Uh, West Virginia has switched from votes, we've talked about that before on DTNS, V-O-A-T-Z, which was found to have security flaws, to Democracy Live for overseas military and residents with disabilities to do absentee voting. Delaware and New Jersey are also piloting Democracy Live this summer for their primaries as well. Democracy Live uses AWS's FedRAMP. That is a cloud service that is certified for U.S. government use. So it has the security precautions that the U.S. government requires. Uh, for voting, you fill out a PDF in the cloud, and then the most secure version of this service has you print that ballot at home and mail it in, or the less secure version, submit it electronically. Those electronic submissions use AWS's object lock, to try to prevent any tampering to that PDF after you have submitted it. And an end user has no way of confirming what got printed when they sent it. So the election officials print it at the end, but you don't know, you have no way of checking. Wired notes that healthcare companies, financial institutions, tech companies, even the NSA have all been breached. So even with all these security precautions, do you need voting to be more secure? Because these very highly secure instances that I just mentioned all got breached. And a bank only has to preserve privacy from third parties. So there's the privacy aspect of this too. It's okay if the bank knows how much is in your account, because that's kind of the point of the bank is knowing how much is in your account. Whereas it's not okay for election officials to know who you voted for. There is a presumption of privacy with ballots that needs to be maintained as well. So it makes it extra difficult to create secure voting that is end to end. Beyond these test systems from Democracy Live, keep in mind 19 states let ballots be emailed right now, which is even less secure, and 26 of them allow fax, which isn't particularly secure either. Last Friday, the US Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, along with the Election Assistance Commission in the United States, sent a risk assessment to the states warning that electronic ballot return technologies are high risk even with controls in place. Uh, so it's it's that different risk tolerance plus the extra difficulties involved in protecting privacy that I think dispute the notion that some people have like, hey, if a bank keep my financial information secure, why can't we have secure voting online? Do, do you all feel like you're on, on board with this assessment or, or do you think we should move faster or even slower? Gosh, I mean, listening to all of this, my first reaction is, well, online voting doesn't sound like it's ready yet. <laughs> it sounds like we have all these instances of it just not working well or there being breaches or, you know, just something being insecure. Well, in-person voting has its problems as well. So I'm not going to sit here and be like, well, we all just have to get to the polling booth and that'll solve everything because that is rife with its own problems. Patrick, I don't know how you feel being uh, outside the U.S., but... I know here I'm I'm kind of uncomfortable with all my solution options. Um, I mean, you're. I think there are two things to consider. First of all, uh, voting is kind of a 
different case than most other things where technology can apply because the stakes are so high that it seems to me um, it, the, the big question is how does it improve the process? Mm. Uh, and in most cases, I don't think electronic voting improves it significantly. Um, there are other ways. If you really want to make sure that um, voting is accessible to more people, there are other ways like changing the day of the vote, things that have been discussed many, many times and that you were asking, Sarah, uh, how I look at it from here. Uh, we have voting on days that are days off, and that is a no-brainer, complete no-brainer. Uh, the second thing is, of course, there are some uh, people who, for whom it would be useful. The two examples you gave, Tom, are uh, excellent ones. And I think if you try to apply a, 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 the best possible solution, even if it's not perfect, um, for those people, it might indeed have value. And even uh, in this system that you described, it's not what you think of when you think electronic voting. You might think, you know, oh, I vote through a computer. No, the, to, if, in order to make it as secure as possible, you actually have to print the thing and mail it in, it's, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like to make sure that people can do it from home maybe a little bit more easily. Um, and for those people, if it provides a, a definite benefit, uh, it, I think it's more acceptable because the target for hacking isn't as wide. Mm. And so that makes it less attractive to mount uh, 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 ambitious operations to hack stuff. If everyone's voting by electronically, obviously, then the potential for things getting screwed up is much bigger. Yeah, there's a wider surface area there. Yeah, to, to sum it up, I think that's a really good way of putting it. If it doesn't improve the voting process, we're not ready for it. Uh, elect, as you mentioned, Sarah, there are problems with in-person voting almost entirely related to electronic in-person voting. If you're doing the old-fashioned paper ballot without electronics, it's actually really secure. But as soon as you put an electronic machine in there, then we start to see problems. And if you put it online, you see more problems. So until it can meet Patrick's test of, did it actually improve the voting? I'd say, yeah, uh, it, someday we'll get there, but not, not there yet. Well, maybe this whole next story will help improve phone form factors. I don't know. Stay with me. The Korean Herald and ET News showed a concept phone called the LG Wing with a 6.8-inch display that swivels up horizontally into a T-shape to reveal an additional 4-inch square display below. So they're kind of two displays that look like a wing span, really more than a wing. The second display can show a keyboard, editing controls, supplemental content. Now, we've heard complaints that phone factors these days are kind of boring. They all look the same. Everyone's ready for something different. But then you look at foldables, they're not necessarily necessary and often have a lot of issues uh, with the way that they're built. So what do we think about swivelables? <laughs> I can't wait for that well, to catch on as the name. <laughs> it rolls I right off the, the time. Big, the, again, I have two things to say here. My first reaction to this is, wow, this is super dumb. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my second reaction is, actually... Maybe. Why not? You know, it might be for people who don't know what it looks like. It essentially looks like a sidekick. You know, the thing you would flip uh, and the screen would go up and, mm. and be in, in uh, landscape mode and you could type on the keyboard on the part that remains. Uh, but the second thing is um, probably the issue would be the thickness of it. And that's where and, you know, the 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 use and tear of the mechanism of it and stuff like that. Um, mm. So, yeah, that that might be might, that might kill the product for most people. It feels like it could be pretty solid uh, on that hinge, but I'm not sh I, I'm I'm still trying to figure out what it's not good after for. two this, years. This is kind of like foldables. Like what 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 do I need this for? Uh, it This is going to be this is going to be more solid than a hinge. But. What's that use case where I'm like, oh man, if only I had a T swivel phone, I could totally do this. Um, the the advantage to me is that you still get the full surface area for editing while having the keyboard available. So you you extend your surface area with the same form factor that you had before. For editing what? Oh, documents, like just, if you want just, to, yeah, to work. Just anything yeah. you do on a mobile device. Yeah, I don't edit documents on a mobile device. I, I type because as little as possible. you don't have a swivelable? 
Uh, because you don't okay. have a Super Bowl. It'll change. It'll change my whole perspective. All right, maybe. Maybe. I mean, this is this all seems like we just need that perfect perfect device you know there are uh hybrid tablets you know where people are like this is actually great because sometimes it's a tablet and sometimes it's a laptop this is we're trying to still get to that phone version of that but the form factor is so small that we now are in a wing shape well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Twitter, as we mentioned in the quick hits yesterday on the show, at the very top of the show, will have two kinds of notifications added to tweets that aren't considered serious enough to remove. So let's dig in now that we've had a chance to look at these a little closer. Uh, one of these kinds of notifications they call a label. Uh, that leaves the tweet intact. You can read it. You can see it in your timeline. But it adds this label, get the facts about COVID-19, and those words link to either a Twitter-curated page or an external source that have vetted, verified information. The next level above label is a warning. Uh, the warning text blocks content but includes a link to the view to view the tweet if you want. So if you've seen a block of sensitive content, sometimes you'll see that where it's like, make a dink of sensitive content, you can click here if you still want to see it. This will say, some or all of the content shared in this tweet conflicts with guidance from public health experts regarding COVID-19. Learn more, which links out to those same vetted sources, or view, which lets you view the, the tweet that they think is wrong. Each tweet will be assessed on not only whether it's misleading or disputed, but on how harmful it is. So if something is unverified, it'll be left alone. They're like, no, we don't know. We, maybe this is right, maybe it's wrong. This is information which could be true or false. An example would be chloroquine is our best shot at a cure for COVID-19. I don't know, could be true, could be false, might be controversial, but nobody knows. We're gonna call that unverified. Uh, disputed are statements or assertions in which the accuracy, truthfulness, or credibility of the claim is contested or unknown. So in other words, chloroquine is the cure for COVID-19. A lot of people are like, well, maybe it's not. That's contested. So that would be a disputed fact. And then misleading is plain old statements or assertions that have been confirmed to be false or misleading by subject matter experts like public health authorities, like fish medicine can cure COVID-19. No, it absolutely can't. Do not take fish medicine. Uh, that's for fish, not for people. Those categories, disputed, misleading, unverified, are combined with the estimated propensity for harm. So they, they, Twitter's going to say, is it possible that it would cause moderate harm or severe harm? If either of these is moderate harm, disputed or misleading, then they put the label on, the one that lets you see the tweet but says, hey, here's some more information about COVID-19. If a disputed claim... The one where like it might it's contested, but we may we you know we're we're saying it's probably not true. The, if it's disputed with severe, then it gets the warning. That's the one where it covers the content and makes you click to see it. If it's misleading and has potential for severe harm, like take fish medicine, then it gets removed. You don't even see it. That's when they actually just take it off Twitter. The question of how they will be judging all of this is vague. They say they will proactively monitor and rely on trusted partners. They don't talk about how they'll do it in the post on this. My guess is it's something like what Facebook is doing, which is using fact checkers to determine if something is false, then adding the warning labels, and in Facebook's case, reducing distribution, which I think Twitter does too. And if it might lead to imminent harm on Facebook, they remove it. Uh, according to the Community Standards Enforcement Report Facebook put out today, it's still relying on humans at 60 partner fact-checking organizations to identify misinformation. So a human's got to see it first. And when it's flagged by a human, then an AI can go look for similar stuff. Stuff that's either absolutely identical or like, wait a minute, somebody's doing the same thing, but they changed a little. AI can, is good at finding that, but it can't find new instances on its own. In fact, Facebook CTO Mike Schreffer said in a press call about this report, building a novel classifier for something that understands content it's never seen before takes time and a lot of data. So back to Twitter. They've got this kind of four-part test here that they're going to combine to decide whether you should see it or not. Patrick, do you feel like this is fair? It certainly seems like it is better than 
other solutions. <laughs> no, I think it's fair. Um, the the theory is fair, of course. Then the implementation is always uh, the biggest difficulty, but it certainly seems like it is fair. Um, Twitter has been notoriously timid with content moderation. It is one of their principles, and I think at the very least, this gives us this gives them more tools to use because essentially until now, and this applies to COVID-19, it will be likely applied to other things uh, in the future. This gives them an opportunity to do something about a tweet that they don't want to remove for various reasons. Um, and that can be very useful on Twitter where um, these kinds of tweets are very common. So I think it is a very positive move for Twitter. Is it going to fix everything? No, but it helps in specific ways. Yeah, I, I think actually in, in a lot of ways, I think COVID-19 is an easier one to, to attack. Uh, no one likes COVID-19. No one's out there defending COVID-19's right uh, to exist. Everybody wants to get rid of it, right? Uh, so you have an easier target. Uh, you also have more consensus over what's true about it. Uh, I'm not saying you have perfect consensus by any stretch, but more so than the more flimsy stuff that, that you get in the in the general political waters, uh, because there are some some solidly knowable things uh, about a virus, even with the the number that are unknowable. So I think it's a little easier to attack here. Uh, I don't think this will cause as much of a controversy as if they applied the same things to politics. If this was going to political statements or or other speech, I would start to pick at the difference between unverified and disputed. Because unverified is, this is information that could be true or false. It's it, We don't know. And disputed says uh, it's either contested or unknown. Those are the, the unknown part of that is the same. So how do you tell if something's unknown, whether you call it unverified and just leave it up or you call it disputed and slap a label on it? Uh, I think with COVID-19, that's less of an issue because the disputed stuff really is the contested stuff uh, and 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 verifiable like chloroquine is I used as an example because that's one where there is some truth to the fact that this could be useful, but some people are exaggerating the claims about it. I think there are other examples of things that could be in the same category. You're right. It's not going to fix every controversial thing that uh, is discussed on Twitter. Uh, but there are other things that uh, could fall in the same mm. ballpark. Uh, I could give a couple of examples. But uh, certainly, and, and again, it keeps Twitter from having to absolutely remove the... Uh, um, the, the 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 content, which is something they are very, very uh, reluctant to do. And it gives them a tool to do something about those kinds of, uh, that type of content. And yeah, well, yeah, as you said, it's not going to fix all of the contentious stuff, but some of it. And when it is possible to decide, to, to see, is this, uh, 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 do, does most, do most people agree about this thing? then they can do something about it. I think that's a, a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. It kind of polices itself in a cool way. You can submit stories and vote on others to get them up to the top at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Not that we don't thank our moderators who do a very, very good job that too. keeping that place place clean. But I know what you mean. Like, people do the voting, right? It, 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 it all just kind of floats up based on the voting. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Chris Christensen, our amateur traveler, we miss you, Chris, said, I almost laughed out loud that Newton Mail was still being supported. That was a story from our show yesterday. Chris says, I wrote the email for the Apple Newton called Newton Mail client back in 1993. And for a minute, I thought that's what you were talking about. <laughs> I, I wrote back to Chris. I was like, I imagine these code bases are entirely different, but I don't know that. And he's like, well, I wrote the Newton Mail client for the Newton in 1993 in Newton script. So he's guessing that <laughs> Newton Mail, the app on your phone today, probably doesn't use Newton script. And I think he's probably right. Uh, that's good times. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, <laughs> a, 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 a little slice of memory lane. Hey, shout out to patrons that are master and grandmaster levels, including Philip Shane, John Atwood, and Chris Benito. Also, thanks to Patrick Beja. Patrick, what's been going on since we saw you last? 
I am all about video games these days. Uh, if you enjoy video games, why don't you go check out Pixels, which is a podcast I do about video games. It's pretty cool. Every couple of weeks, about an hour or so, you might enjoy it. It's called Pixels, and check it out on your uh, podcast app. And folks, uh, thank you to everybody who has been pitching in uh, to cover for the folks who no longer can afford to support the show directly. You guys have been incredibly generous, uh, and we really, really, really appreciate that. Uh, for those who love the show and just find themselves in a situation where they can't monetarily contribute, uh, and even for those who, who are patrons as well, there's an easy way to support the show that has a huge effect without costing you anything but a couple of minutes, and that's to review us specifically on Apple's podcasting app. Uh, yes, I know you may not use Apple Podcasts, uh, but you could still get in there and review, even if you're a Windows and Android user, uh, and let them know what you think about the show. Uh, the more people that review us, the higher we rise in the rankings, and uh, we think, anyway. Uh, and it certainly helps more people understand what's going on with the show and how it works. So if, if you want to do one thing to help the show today, uh, go leave one of those reviews. Yeah, it doesn't even really matter what you write. Just put, put the stars in, and that, that helps feed the beast for us. And thank you for doing that. We also do read the reviews and some of them are so nice. So thank you so much for liking the show. We're just, we're nothing without you. And if you have feedback for us, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. Bye. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>